In this lesson, we're going to be talking about how neurotransmitters are released from a neuron. Before we do, we need to review a little bit of what we've already learned. We've learned that when a neuron is, is at rest, the inside of the neuron is negatively charged at about minus 70 millivolts. We refer to this as the resting potential of a neuron. We've also learned that when some event occurs, which we haven't described yet, that causes a slight depolarization of the membrane, we can reach the threshold for the voltage-gated sodium channels and cause those channels to open. When the channels open, sodium flows into the neuron because of the electrical gradient and the concentration gradient. That influx of sodium into the neuron causes the membrane to depolarize even more in that particular area. Following that, we begin to get an efflux of potassium through the potassium channels. This efflux of potassium causes the inside of the neuron to begin to move towards negative again, which we refer to as repolarization and hyperpolarization. Finally, if this occurs somewhere near the axon hillock, then because the channels are so densely packed, we can get a chain reaction of sodium channels opening, allowing sodium to enter the cell, and potassium channels um, opening, allowing the potassium to exit the cell. And this is propagated down the neuron and is called the action potential. Okay, so let's take a look then at the end of the neuron, the drawing there is supposed to represent the um, axon terminal, and we can see the uh, sodium channels that we've talked about in the past. So here's, um, oops, in the wrong spot. Okay, so here, here we have a, a sodium channel, a voltage-gated sodium channel, and here we have a voltage-gated potassium channel. Um, as we've been talking about, we're going to have that sodium coming in and the potassium going out. This is the action potential coming down the neuron. Now, the important thing for us to understand is when the sodium enters the axon terminal, that will cause our axon terminal to become positively charged on the inside, just like the other parts of the neuron that we've talked about. That depolarization of the axon terminal is what will re, re, um, lead to the release of neurotransmitter. But before we can understand how the neurotransmitter is released into the neuron, we, we first need to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about what else we're going to find down here in this axon terminal. So let me include some new things. Inside the axon terminal, we're going to find these what kind of look like donuts, and they are actually known as synaptic vesicles. So let's get that down. We have synaptic vesicles. All right. Well, what exactly is a synaptic vesicle? If we were to take a closer look at a synaptic vesicle, we would find that it's a sphere, or roughly spherical, uh, object. And it's actually made of something that we're already familiar with. You should be thinking, as you see these, of a phospholipid bilayer with the heads and the tails facing in opposite directions. So that's hard to draw. I'm not going to draw that every time. But that's what the sphere is made out of. Now, on the inside of the sphere, we've got something new. And I'm just going to put it in here. Is this blue colored stuff. And what that's supposed to represent for us is chemicals that are known as neuro... dash in here because I'm out of space, and that's an E transmitters. So neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are special chemical substances that neurons use to communicate. 
So going back over here again, what we have is our synaptic vesicles that are filled with neurotransmitters. It's another important thing down in the axon terminal. Okay, one other thing that we need to add here. It's a new type of voltage-gated channel. And I'm going to put it down here since it's getting busy up top. And this, this new kind of voltage-gated channel, uh, we're just going to represent it as a, a triangle. And this is a calcium channel. So it's a voltage-gated calcium channel. All right. That means we must have some calcium floating around out here. Now, you'll notice with this calcium that I have drawn two positive charges. That's because calcium in this ionic form has two positive charges. All right. Well, the point of all this is to say that when we get that action potential coming down the axon to the terminal, and as we've discussed, it's nothing more than the sodium coming in and the potassium going out, happening over and over, that leads to the depolarization on the inside of the axon terminal. And it is that depolarization that will lead this voltage-gated calcium channel to open. And when it does, of course, the calcium ions then begin to enter into the terminal. Now, I want you to think about this question before we go any farther. We've already established that the action potential is going to cause the synaptic, um, I'm sorry, the uh, axon terminal to depolarize. And when it does, the calcium channel will open, and I've said calcium will go in. But the question is, why would calcium flow into that axon terminal when the terminal is already depolarized and calcium is a positively charged ion? Think about that for a moment. See if you can come up with an answer. Okay, hopefully you've come up with the answer that there must be a, a big concentration gradient for the calcium. There's a lot of calcium outside of the neuron and not very much calcium inside of the neuron. Therefore, the calcium is going to flow down its concentration gradient and enter the axon terminal even though the terminal is already depolarized. Okay, so the next question then, or the next part of this video, is to figure out what exactly happens or what effect does the influx of calcium have on the terminal button. Well, let's take a look at that. What we're going to do is we're going to take this little chunk of our illustration and we're going to move it down farther and blow it up a little bit to see what's happening. All right, so here we go. And I'm going to rotate it a little bit. We're, we'll put the, uh, the synaptic vesicle right here. Let's go ahead and put some neurotransmitter inside of this synaptic vesicle. And then <clears throat> let's take a look at the plasma membrane that forms the, uh, the terminal button of the neuron. And you could see in our, in our previous section that we had one of those uh, synaptic vesicles that was right up against the plasma membrane. So that's what we're looking at here. When we have it in this particular position, we say that the synaptic vesicle is docked with the plasma membrane. And it's beyond the scope of this particular class to discuss how this docking occurs, although it's a really fascinating topic, and I would encourage you to go out and do a little bit of reading on it sometime if you're, if you're interested. But for us, we're going to say we already have the synaptic vesicle docked up against this plasma membrane. Now let's just take a look at what would be on the other side here, too. We're going to have a space in between this plasma membrane here and another plasma membrane uh, down here. And this other plasma membrane that we're drawing could be 
the plasma membrane on another neuron, or it could be the plasma membrane on a muscle, or it could be a plasma membrane on a gland. So, so there are a couple of possible targets for, um, for the signal that's coming from the neuron that we've drawn up here. Well, let's in our example we'll go ahead and say what we have down here is another neuron, and I'm going to introduce some new term terminology so that we can talk more clearly. This neuron that is coming before the synapse, so what we have right here is the synapse, and in this case, the synapse is a gap between these two neurons. There are other kinds of synapses, but this is the one we're going to talk about most frequently. Well, this neuron up here that comes before the synapse, we could refer to as the presynaptic neuron, or we might refer to this as the presynaptic membrane. Over here on the other side, coming after the gap, we have our postsynaptic neuron, or our postsynaptic membrane. All right, so back up here. Plasma membrane has a vesicle docked against it. As we talked about earlier, because the action potential has come down, we've had an influx of calcium into this uh, presynaptic neuron. Now, here's what happens. This influx of calcium causes an interesting change here in how the plasma membrane of the synaptic vesicle um, interacts with the plasma membrane of the axon terminal. So let's move over here and take a look at what happens. Here's our vesicle, here's our membrane, and I'm going to use a different color uh, to represent this, something that will catch your eye to show what happens. This outer portion here of the plasma membrane for the synaptic vesicle fuses with the inner portion of the plasma membrane for the axon terminal. And here we can see that it happens on both sides. And then likewise, the plasma membrane or the part of that lipid bilayer here on the inner portion of the vesicle fuses with the outer portion of the plasma membrane on the axon terminal. And so when that happens, what we end up with is a hole. You can see it right here. We've we've formed a hole in this synaptic vesicle. And we now have a new shape. We get something that looks just a little bit like the Greek letter omega. And in fact, when these are seen under a, an electron microscope, they're sometimes referred to as omega bodies. But the important point is, here's a hole that's been formed. There's a pore in the vesicle so that the neurotransmitter that we have inside of here can now exit from the vesicle and actually exit from the terminal here. So let's, let's just pretend like we've got our we've got our pore that's been established up here. Sorry, sorry that I drew that poorly. But the point is, now this, synap this, this neurotransmitter can actually leave this vesicle and enter into the synapse of the neuron. And of course, what's going to happen is because we have a high concentration of the neurotransmitter up here, that means we have a concentration gradient for our neurotransmitter so that the neurotransmitter will diffuse across the synapse and it's going to come into contact with this postsynaptic membrane. We'll find on this postsynaptic membrane a, a new type of protein that we haven't talked about yet. I'll, I'll just represent it here like this. And this is known as a receptor protein. And receptor protein is often just abbreviated as receptor. So here we have a receptor for the neurotransmitter. In our next video, we'll take a look at these receptor proteins and how they work.